Hello everyone, my name is Aparna Mahendranath and I'm a bioengineering major at Clemson. I'm here to talk to you about galvanic corrosion and plastic deformation, specifically targeting the topics behind questions 4 and 6. First, let's talk about galvanic corrosion. So corrosion is a process where a refined material, such as metal, converts to a more chemically stable form, such as an oxide, hydroxide, or sulfide, due to a chemical or electrochemical reaction. The galvanic corrosion is a specific type of corrosion, and it's also called a bimetallic corrosion because it is an electrochemical process when two dissimilar metals are coupled in a corrosive electrolyte. This means that two metals are brought into electrical contact under water, and a galvanic couple will form. This is also considered to be the foundation of corrosion because one metal will become the anode and will corrode faster than it would alone, and the other metal will become the cathode and corrode slower than it would alone. Galvanic corrosion is really important regarding any medical device because you don't want the medical device to cause galvanic corrosion inside the human body. One application to note is the pacemaker. When a pacemaker is implemented, implemented into the human body, you want to make sure that the electrical current from the pacemaker does not corrode galvanically with the blood. Some examples of galvanic corrosion can be seen in everyday life. This is an example of galvanic corrosion. So this is a picture of a screw made out of stainless steel material and it was attached to a cadmium plated steel washer. When water was applied to this um, substance, it caused this blue residue to form. Another notable example is the Statue of Liberty. The exterior of Statue of Liberty is made out of an exterior copper and the interior is made out of a cast iron. When it rained, water got trapped within the torch of the Statue of Liberty and leaked onto the exterior. This actually resulted in the galvanic corrosion so that the interior material had to be um, replaced. The copper was actually a cathode and the cast iron was the anode. The leaking water caused the galvanic corrosion to take place and the interior was then replaced with stainless steel. Now you might be wondering, oh, the Statue of Liberty was once made out of copper and had the color characteristics of copper, but is currently blue slash green and is very different. Is this due to galvanic corrosion? The answer is no. The color change of the Statue of Liberty is actually due to oxidative corrosion, a different form of corrosion that happened due to the exposure of copper to oxygen. This produced an oxidative reaction and the color changed from brown to green. Let's take a look at this question. Which of the following best describes the process of galvanic corrosion? A. Degradation from exposure to a harsh environment. B. Differences in oxygen tension within and outside of a crevice. C. Micromotion between material when under a load. D. Free radical oxidation. Or E. Electrochemical potential created between two metals in physical contact when immersed in a conductive medium. If you chose E, you were correct. So galvanic corrosion is not limited to a harsh environment. Cold or hot temperatures will not cause galvanic corrosion. So answer choice A is eliminated. Answer choice B is wrong because galvanic corrosion is caused by an electrochemical difference, not just oxygen tension. It, galvanic corrosion can also happen on a surface and is not limited to just a crevice. So answer choice B can be eliminated. Looking at answer choice C, uh, this choice actually implies mechanical forces causing galvanic corrosion, something that's not true. Galvanic corrosion is more of an electrical or electrochemical sort of reaction, so answer choice C can be eliminated. Finally, galvanic corrosion is not caused by oxidation. Oxidation corrosion and galvanic corrosion are two different types of corrosion, so free radical oxidation has nothing to do with galvanic corrosion itself. This results in the answer choice E being correct. The electrochemical potential created between two metals in physical contact when immersed in a conductive medium is the correct answer. Now let's look at plastic deformation. So plastic deformation can be analyzed through looking at a loading curve. And a loading curve basically analyzes the stress versus strain of a material. Stress is defined as the force over an area and strain is defined as the change in length over the original length. A loading curve is really useful when looking at a specific 
material and seeing how much force can be applied to it before it breaks. This can be applied to any sort of orthopedic application. So in a stress versus strain plot, the Young's modulus shows the stiffness of an object or the ability to withstand changes in length under a particular force. The higher the Young's modulus is, the more brittle the material is. Also in a loading curve, E, the elastic limit, is really important because it shows how much the material can take a certain amount of force and still return to its original shape. After the el elastic limit, the material will enter a state of plastic deformation. And this basically means that the material cannot return to its original shape. So once this force is removed, the material will permanently be deformed. With elastic deformation, however, this is not true because the material can return to its original shape once the force is removed. This is seen through the unloading curves, shown by the red and light blue lines. The red line shows the elastic unloading curve, which basically demonstrates that after a certain load, the original shape can be returned. But with the plastic deformation and the plastic unloading curve, you can see that even after the force is removed, the original shape is not obtained. It still has some form of stress and strain at any given point. Let's look at this question. Which of the following best describes plastic deformation? A, the change in length of a material under loading that returns to its original length once the load is removed. B, progressive deformation of a material in response to a constant force over an extended period. C, the ability of a material to resist deformation. D, change in length of a material under loading that does not return to its original length once the load is removed. Or E, the relative measure of the deformation of an object due to a load. If you picked answer choice D, you were correct. Answer choice A is wrong because it actually describes elastic deformation since it sta states that the material will, re will return to its original length. Answer choice B actually describes creep since it actually shows how a slow time dependent process will actually cause total deformation under stress after a period of time. Answer choice C talks about stiffness or the ability of a material to resist deformation. We talked about this with the elastic or Young's modulus. Answer choice D is the correct answer because it talks about plastic deformation in the right way. Answer choice E can be eliminated since it describes strain, which can be looked at by looking at the changes in length of an object. Here are my sources, and thank you so much. I hope this was beneficial.